Thank you, first of all, uh, the organizers for, for inviting me. It's, it's such a pleasure to inaugurate uh, this uh, workshop. Uh, and uh, what can I say? Uh, Krishna and I are going way back and uh, I only have uh, pleasant memories uh, from our interaction. And I mentioned that during the presentation. Uh, the goal of this talk is to, to dig a little bit deeper into the way we uh, understand materials and the methods that are being used, especially in the computational science domain. A second goal is to impress you that the role of computation has changed and in the recent years, the recent decades, uh, this partnership between humans and machines and computers is uh, changing the scientific method itself and the way we conduct science. So let's see if I can advance the, the slide, yes. Now I'm going back in history many years ago and uh, looking at the way technology has evolved. And to make the observation, I would like to make the observation that along this uh, evolution path, physics, chemistry, mathematics at some point uh, played a critical role. More recently, in the last few hundred years, maybe after the Industrial Revolution, studies of materials and understanding of the role of materials in science and technology development have increased. There are materials everywhere from metallurgy to the, uh, to the, the building of automobiles and airplanes to the modern devices, the computers. Uh, there are inorganic materials, metals, organic materials, metals, ceramics, polymers. Everything is out there. It is clear, however, that most of these materials along the history of science and technology have been discovered. Humanity kind of stumbled upon materials with extraordinary properties and functionality. We discovered continents, we discovered planets, we discovered atomic structures. We also discovered materials, uh, groups of people scientists, engineers, technologists searching a certain domain found that there are high temperature superconductors. Or there is this weird structure of carbon, two-dimensional structure called graphene that has exceptional properties. So here is a video clip that shows the evolution of a void in a graphene, in graphene. Nobody can claim that they design graphene, that somebody said, oh, how about we put atoms in these hexagonal positions on a 2D uh, structure and we will get a material of extraordinary properties. No, these materials have been discovered. The role of discovery in science and engineering cannot be emphasized strongly enough. We start with composition, structure, and, and processing parameters and predict the properties and functionality. For example, graphene, may lead to uh, materials uh, that are flexible electronics that can be you can lead presumably if they haven't done that already to I don't know cell phones or laptops that are flexible that you can fold and put in your pocket and then unfold and use that is possible as we speak no I'm a computational scientist <laughs> like mathematics I like computer simulations. Uh, my group, we like to build models, models of interactions between atoms in materials, models of microstructure evolution, models of properties as function of composition, temperature, pressure, and so on. Some models are better than others, as you can tell. And much like theorists or experimentalists, we use a set of tools. These tools have limitations. They have applicability limits. This is a diagram. Maybe this is the figure that I'm most famous for. I've seen this figure on the hallways of 
uh, Washington DC institutions, Department of Energy and others, without any reference to the paper or, or the author or anything. They just like it. They think it's cool, it's nicely colored. Uh, for me, it's much more than that. It shows how various methods have an applicability domain that can be as low as nanometers and picoseconds in terms of length scale and time scale. Could go to mesoscale, microns, microseconds, or all the way to continue. I do practice most of these. I never did a dislocation dynamic simulation, but everything else I run hands-on. Uh, you also have the software here that we use in my group to do density functional theory or molecular dynamics. Uh, Krishna and I partner in some molecular dynamics simulations back in, in Los Alamos uh, many, many years ago with some success. This diagram is important because it says that depending on the phenomenon that you want to examine, the physics, the chemistry of that phenomenon, one should decide on what method or methods to use. Sometimes it's necessary to use two of them and couple them, or maybe three. It is never about using all of these from one end to the other. The method we are using depends on the problem of as hand. It's driven, this research is driven by the scientific goal or by the engineering objective. So let me give an example of how molecular dynamics, for example, help us, helps us with two major aspects of any scientific research, with understanding and with predicting. So here we look at gallium. This is work done in a group that Krishna and I were at Los Alamos with Michael Vasquez, who is a magician in terms of molecular dynamics, especially setting up interatomic potentials. We look at gallium. We made the observation that gallium melts at room temperature. You can see here a person who's brave enough to hold a piece of gallium in their hand, and it does melt. You see liquid and solid coexisting. The question is, how does melting occur, initiates, and proceeds? Is it in the entire volume at one time? Maybe the interfaces are moving along? We would like to understand this phenomenon. And to the right, you see molecular dynamic simulations of gallium atoms vibrating at a temperature that is a little, above, a little bit above the melting temperature. The atoms are pink because I like pink on black. Gallium atoms don't have any color, of course. If you watch the liquid, which is a disorder phase on the left and the right of the computational domain, we use periodical boundary condition, we take over the solid, more ordered domain, the one one structure. And as you can see, this is pretty dramatic. Every time I watch this, I, I, I feel like I'm watching a thriller, a movie. The solid fights for its life, tries to stay stable to, to continue to exist, but slowly but surely the interface between the liquid and the solid advances, the disorder propagates, and in the end, the entire domain is liquid. This is how melting occurs. Molecular dynamics helps us understand that and could help us make predictions. What if we add something to the atom? We make an alloy. What will be the change in the melting temperature? what would be the change in other properties of an alloy. However, one can put enough trust in these type of simulations to make estimates about how a material property will evolve with changes in, competition, in composition or in other parameters such as pressure. Thermodynamics is a wonderful thing and uh, looking at multi-component materials and trying to predict, uh, for example, uh, phase equilibrium, the coexistence of phases, is something that we have not invented recently. It started many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, and originated, you would be amazed, I think, in the interest people had in liquor, in drinking uh, uh, highly uh, concentrated uh, alcoholic beverages, which they tried to make through distillation. And at that time, the equilibrium between liquids and vapors was of some importance. After 
long uh, experimentation and trial and error, somebody came up with the idea that maybe we can create a diagram, a binary diagram that relates temperature and composition, alcohol content, water. Apparently, whoever drew this diagram, vapor liquid diagram, was already inebriated. I think the lines are a bit shaky. But that shows that strongly coupling theory and experimentation was always important in the history of science. And I've learned uh, during my studies uh, a few decades ago that uh, we humans uh, are able to draw quite accurate multi-component diagrams, ternary diagrams, for example, in this example. You see the lines are so thin, the surfaces are perfect, as if there was no uncertainty in our knowledge of these equilibrium domains. It is too perfect to be true, I would say. Lucky us, we, we got an opportunity to calculate equilibrium between various phases, thanks to Gibbs an American scientist who, I like to say, lived uh, his life in heaven. He was born and died in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, he was an outstanding individual who made a number of contributions. But one of them that it, it pertains to this topic is that he realized that minimizing the energy of the entire system, the free energy of the entire system, is the actual uh, target for any equilibrium calculation. It is not the phase that has the lowest free energy. It could be a mixture of phases that have an even lower one. So he formulated that in terms of the chemical potential. Equilibrium is attended when different components have the same chemical potential in the phases that are at equilibrium. You know, uh, like many of you, uh, although we like mathematics and like solving equations, and here is an example on the left, um, how uh, getting free energy models, function of temperature, composition, and pressure from molecular dynamics and ab initio MD for EFT leads to derivations of the chemical potential, and then the equilibrium diagram could be calculated. But we would like to see that, to have a visual uh, expression, representation, of this equilibrium. And on the right, you will see several phases of one of the famous uh, actinite elements uh, that has uh, no less than six solid allotropes and a liquid. And if you look at the top, the temperature is listed in Kelvin. And these phases, the liquid is red, the others really doesn't matter. Look at the relative position of the free energies. That relative position of free energies changes with temperature. So there is a geometrical representation of the Gibbs rules. It says that if we would draw a common tangent to these curves, we will be able to find the equilibrium compositions for, for, a, for the system. We feel the need to visualize. That seems to be paramount. But I'm going to dispute this desire, this goal of visualizing properties of materials especially thermodynamic, but any others in the slides that come. Let me go back to, again to, 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 some, uh, to a historical um, moment. Uh, uh, I would say a, a, a critical, a key moment in the evolution of uh, mathematics and of science. Everything we, I, I presented so far is kind of deterministic, and the cause and effect are clearly related. But the, the, the occurrence of the statistics and the stochastic systems made a significant impact on the science. This is Reverend Thomas Bayes, who lived 300 years ago. He was interested in winning at games. And uh, allow me not to speculate why a reverend would like to win at games. But no matter what, he, he said something that was of critical importance, but Few people realize that. He said, I notice that the more I play, the better I am, and the more I win. And he formulated that in a famous paper in 1863. 
saying that there is a relationship between the prior probability of a model being, model parameters being correct given some data set and the conditional probability that relates the data we have and the model. And that will result in a posterior probability that could be a correction of the initial one. In other words, an improved model. In our case, if we have a model of some thermodynamic properties with parameters, we can throw in some guesses, guesses based on expert opinion and do this calculation and get as a result a posterior probability. The more data we have and the more data we add, the better our final model, optimized model will be. That changed things dramatically. And we were, we, uh, were lucky to have an opportunity now to not only calculate diagrams or any other material property for that matter, but also to add uncertainty to those properties. This is a very simple diagram, uranium oxide, plutonium oxide, it's called a cigar diagram. You have the liquid above, a solid solution uh, on the lower part, the liquid is lying in red, the solid is lying in blue, cannot be simpler than that. But then if we look at, and at the time we looked at more than 20 data sets, using Bayesian statistics and a genetic algorithm, we were able that was so many years ago, 17 years ago, to get uncertainty evaluation, confidence interval for both, intervals for both these lines. Why is this important? It's important because computation in partnership with theory and experiment can result not only in good models, predictive models, but also in evaluation of the level of confidence we can have in, this, in what we know about materials or about any natural system in general. That is something that had an impact already on the way we design materials. So remember in discovery, we started with composition, structure and properties, and we predict what properties and functionality the material we have. In design, we have an inverse problem. This is an actual picture of the phone case. If I, you know, the case of my phone, it's a rubbery material. And you can ask the question, how can I design a better one? Maybe lighter, but as flexible with similar properties, but different color, I don't know. We can look at that and calculate back with uncertainty what the composition structure processing parameters should be. This is of course an inverse problem and mathematicians know very well that inverse problems are often ill posed in the sense that they may not have a solution or that, or that they may have an infinite number of solutions. Material design is now something that we can use to create in materials with improved properties, not only to discover new ones, which we will never stop doing, but also to create improved materials for science and technology. Things have changed again. I'm, I'm amazed how key people along the history of science and engineering have been able to create such dramatic improvements in the way we conduct our research. And one of them is Alan Turing. Uh, Turing, uh, proposed in a famous paper in 1950 that the question, can machines think? He developed already uh, at the National Physics Laboratory in UK, uh, a machine, a computer that was able to add numbers and multiply and divide and uh, subtract far quicker than any human being. And that was used to decipher the Enigma code, the machine, German machine for for sending messages. If you saw the movie, The Imitation Game, then you, you have the history of that uh, remarkable endeavor. But he also thought, maybe these machines can do more than calculate numbers. Maybe they can think. He even proposed a test. He said, how about we have a group of people, of humans in a room, and then in a separate room, we have an entity 
that could be either a human or a machine. And we will ask our jury panel to interact with that entity and decide through conversations if it's a human or a machine. He estimated that it would take 50 years for a software to be able to trick a panel of humans into believing that the software was indeed a human being. He was wrong by 20, 15 years, right? So in 2014, a software called Eugene Gustman, that was the character that the software embodied, a 13 years old, year old Ukrainian boy. That was very clever from the programmers because a Ukrainian boy may have some shaky English uh, conversational uh, vocabulary or sentences. Uh, here's an example of the di dialogue that one of the panelists, Scott, had with this Eugene. Eugene was a piece of software. Pretty convincing. So I would say that that was a demonstration that software can learn how to carry a conversation with a human to the point that it becomes believable. Furthermore, after some dramatic life and end of life, Alan Turing is now celebrated by the scientific community and by United Kingdom. They are issuing a new bill with his portrait on it. It's a well-deserved recognition that maybe comes a bit too late for Alan Turing as a human, but definitely not too late for him as a mathematician and as a, as a revolutionary scientist. So at this point, I'd like to clarify something because in the rest of the presentation, I will use some concepts and there is often confusion. I, I really get mad when people say, uh, oh, this is gonna be about AI slash ML. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are not the same thing. In fact, machine learning is one component intelligence as proposed by Turing is a technology that can exhibit intelligence much like the humans do. A way of achieving that is through machine learning. Machine learning differs from the algorithms that we use in the past in the multi-scale simulations that I mentioned, DFT, molecular dynamics, finite elements, and so on. In the sense that this algorithm is able to learn without being explicitly programmed to do so. There are no if then statements. If x larger than one, then add y to z. These algorithms is provided with a data set and part of the data set is used to teach, to learn, and the other part, maybe 20%, to test the prediction powder, power of the algorithm. It's a completely different technology. Furthermore, machine learning, which can be supervised, unsupervised, uh, or uh, uh, reinforcement type category, could also have a number of components and classes of algorithms. One of them is deep learning. Deep learning is a concept that could be a bit confusing. It doesn't necessarily imply that our understanding or knowledge is deeper. It's a deeper algorithm. It's based on neural networks, mimicking to some degree the way uh, neurons and synapses are organized and process information in the, human, in the human brain. So with that distinction made, I'm gonna show some results using uh, artificial intelligence components, sometimes machine learning, sometimes deep learning. For example, I picked at random uh, from all the scientific projects we are doing something in thermodynamics. And we, I thought a good example would be in phase diagrams. So by now you know that I'm biased and I really love this research area. Here's a diagram that includes, uh, it's a copper magnesium diagram, experimental information. And as you can tell, it's far from being composed out of thin lines and perfectly well separated regions. It's a bit messy. And the experimental points don't always line up where they should. Now, if we proceed with calculating the free energies, as I mentioned, you remember the, the free energy moving lines that I showed in, in that simulation. 
uh, we can, using Bayesian statistics and machine learning, to add uncertain confidence interval to each free energy curve. These confidence intervals are not uniform. You see they are larger towards the, the edges of the compositional domain. They are smaller because maybe we know, we understand, we have more data about in this region. It could be uh, a compound, for example, stoichiometric compound. Uh, and then based on these free energies, we get phase diagrams that again are not composed of thin lines and sharp points anymore. They are a little blurry along the liquid solid equilibrium domain. If we focus on this region around the eutectic point right here, the question now will not be what exactly the composition is at the eutectic, which we could calculate with some uncertainty. It will be more like, what is the probability of finding various phases here? What's the probability of finding the liquid? You see, it's pretty large. How about uh, the mixture of liquid and one of the FCC phases? How about the phase FCC and Laves phases? That, that is pretty high. I propose to you that this changes the way we interpret material properties data from tables, from databases, from books. We are not going to get, we are not satisfied with only getting precise numbers, even with eight or 16 or 32 digits after the period we would like to get probabilities of various phases or property features being present. And that would also eliminate maybe the need of visualizing these probabilities, th these uh, equilibrium phases or properties in a space, in a hyperspace that includes, for example, composition, temperature, pressure, and so on. In fact, for more than four components in a, in a steel, for example, in complex alloys, we cannot even represent those diagrams, but we may not need to. If we do this analysis and answer the question, given a composition domain and the temperature domain, what is the probability of finding various phases? And if we get that answer correctly, that will be sufficient for us to design a better material. And I am confident that pretty soon that's how material design with uncertainty will operate, will proceed. So the role of computation has changed definitely over, over, over the years, over the, the, the last centuries when, uh, that we can attribute to scientific evolution the, the, uh, and technology evolution over the last decades too. So if we think of the calculations done by Turing and his group, addition, subtractions, multiplications, as I said, that led the evolution of that type of programming and the evolution of the machines of the computers led to, a, to, to achievements such as document pro processing, editors. I wrote my PhD thesis many years ago using uh, uh, PowerPoint, uh, uh, star, whatever, Word Perfect, Word Perfect, sorry, not PowerPoint, Word Perfect was the software that I used for uh, my PhD thesis. You see, in the 80s, there, is, there was an ad here that would offer everybody a 10 megabyte computer for $6,000. This is laughable nowadays. We, we can get much more powerful machines for a lower cost, but at the time, that was a tremendous progress. No more handwritten notes, no more hand-drawn uh, diagrams, machines could collect information, store information in files, could help scientists and engineers uh, make predictions, could help them draw diagrams of properties versus various parameters and so on. Then in the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, the 21st century, we had computer simulations, not only molecular dynamics, this is what, that, what I showed, many finite element simulations with application in science and technology. The power of computation became more apparent and the usefulness of it uh, was also more obvious. I propose to you that we are living through the next stage 
of the inter indirect interaction between computers and humans. Software can now advise scientists and engineers. And I'm gonna show you an example. So it went beyond calculating, editing documents, making simulations, is now a partner in research. It's like a team member that gives us advice. This is a project we are finalizing right now and there are two papers coming out. I can send preprints to anybody who's interested. This is a stunning title. I didn't think, uh, 10 years ago, I didn't think that I would ever write a paper with this type of topic. A team of humans and intelligent software performed a real-time optimization of a synthesis process. And it was driven at some point by the intelligence of The process of choice was flame spray pyrolysis, simplifying to the extreme. We are putting a number of chemicals, gas and liquids in a flame. And then hope, pray to the God of science and technology that the powder that is resulting from the process has the properties we like. Powder size distribution, phase compositions, and so on. Of course, if we change the gas composition, the flow rates, the geometry of the nozzle and other things, we will get different particle size distributions and maybe even different phase stability values. We characterize this powder. And this is something that a human could do. Should there be anything wrong with the powder, a human with experience, the technologist, the operator, after many years of experience, is able to adjust these parameters to some degree and hope that the resulting powder will have the desired properties. The operator could also intervene should there be some of normal conditions occurring. However, we thought that by analyzing the data, the experimental data, which is never enough, for a computational scientist. And by conducting some parallel physics-based computational fluid dynamic simulations, we can collect enough information, enough data, such that we can bring in elements of artificial intelligence. This data collected and analyzed by Bayesian statistics and active learning, which is machine learning that operates on data, an influx of data that comes in permanently. So adjusts the model, adapts the model to the new information. This system was able to control the entire process in almost real time, in near real time, which is minutes, fractions of an hour, uh, compared to what you would need for conducting, let's say, a computational fluid dynamics, which could be even days. So we are able to develop this software that in partnership, working together with the humans, with the technologists and the scientists, can realize this real-time optimization of the process. More than that, it turned out that the software revealed some information about the physics of the system, the chemistry of the system that humans were not able to observe by themselves. This is a result of the relative spread, that's the standard deviation divided by the mean of the powder distribution versus, con versus concentration. Looking at 10,000 data points, we could not tell, we the humans, that there are indeed two regimes, lower concentration regime and a higher concentration regime. But the software was able to point that out. And there are indeed two mechanisms that we the humans figured out after the software made this observation. There are single particles in the lower concentration domain and there are conglomerates forming in the higher concentration domain. And of course, as any good scientist or technologist, we say, okay, we might need to do more experimentation, more experiment in the low concentration domain. And we can do 10, 50, 60 of those. What is interesting is that the software was able to tell, to suggest what exactly parameters we should use to make our next experiment the most impactful, the most productive one. And we did follow the recipe from the software and our model has improved considerably. And there is a paper about, out in press about that right now. So you see, uh, intelligent software can substitute human intelligence and complement and augment our brain to some degree. Here's another example. 
we have developed software that will analyze images of flames to determine their stability. And I'm gonna need your help now. So we're looking at the upper left panel. Can you tell when the candle is stable, not stable, and stable again? Of course you can. Isn't the human brain amazing? We can just look at it and say, oh, that was stable, that was not stable, that was stable again. Can we create a software that makes the same determination? And not to monitor candles, which could be an interesting research project, but rather to monitor the stability of flames in a chemical process like flame spray pyrolysis. And we did create such a software and we were able to use principal component analysis and machine learning to analyze the stability of flames. The advantage of this is you can have this software monitor the process 24 hours a day for 30, uh, 365 or 64 day, uh, uh, days a year. All the time, you will never get tired and can trigger messages to the operator should anything go wrong. Or we have not achieved that yet. Could even change the parameters to restore the normal functionality of the system if we have enough trust in the software that it can do that. So I'm getting closer to the, to the end of my talk and I wanna reinforce this statement that the way we do science and technology is changing. And this partnership between humans and machines reach, has reached, is reaching a point where we will have to acknowledge the contribution of the software. Here are my colleagues, mathematicians, material scientists, physicists, chemists, computer scientists. And in the lower right code, we are proud to, to announce a, a team member who is our Python software, our intelligent software. Will we acknowledge the software in our next publications? Not yet, but maybe in a few years, we will have to. Will, during my lifetime, a software will become a co-author of a scientific publication? I don't know, maybe it will. And I have reasons to believe that at some point we will acknowledge intelligent software as the leading force in discovering new materials or designing new materials. So this is really close to the end. Instead of conclusions or summary, you, you reached your own conclusions. I'm no need for me to make a summary, just a few thoughts about how the scientific method has changed. We, of course, start with observations and design a problem and set up a goal for our research. And then look at experts, consult with experts in experimentation, in theory, in computation, in machine learning, in multi-scale simulations to determine what tools to use. Maybe conduct some experiments ourselves or entrust a software to run the experiments. We do the analysis, or again, we can partner with an intelligent software to make this analysis. There is no way we can avoid validation comparison with reality. If everything goes well, we prototype. If it doesn't go well, we go back to the beginning. And then publish and manufacture and so on. Do all projects need multi-scale simulation? More likely not. Do all projects need uh, elements of artificial intelligence, of course not. If you'd like to discuss this more, I'll, happy, I'll be happy to do that. So now I'll have a word of wisdom for the students who might be attending. As a computational scientist, I would like to share with them what I've learned about how to make a decision about choosing a profession. And I'm gonna express that in terms of computer programming. So if you like to create something, I think there are many options. You could be a scientist like me or an engineer, or who knows, write books or screenplays or direct movies or compose music. Now, if you like to create, but also to help people, I think you could be a professor at one of the universities in, in, in Arizona or somewhere else, or a teacher, or a doctor, or a lawyer. I don't know about lawyers, but anyways, a doctor. 
And if you like to create help, but also tell other people what to do, there are many options there too. So I would end by saying that whatever we do, we all should put all our heart in, in our work, as scientists, engineers, or whatever. It's a pleasure to be here with you virtually. I hope one day I'll be with you in person. So now if you have any questions about what I presented, the scientific content, or about any other topic that crosses your mind and you find relevant for discussing, just let me know. So I'll end leaving this slide uh, up for a few more uh, seconds, and then I should stop sharing. Is that right, Krishna? Or should I keep? Yeah. Um, I think you can uh, continue sharing, um, Marius, because if someone has, if some of, some of the audience have questions and you want to go back to your uh, okay. slides, I think you, you can still uh, be the host. And um, if you think we can open it up to questions, then we can. It's your call. Yeah. So, uh, folks, uh, if you have any questions and if you haven't already typed it into the chat, now is the time to ask these questions. And it could be about anything, right, Marius? Not just science. Sure. Uh, machine learning liable to adopt the human biases when looking for relationships and data. Ooh, that's a really good one. I think there would be, right? Uh, Who is it? Could you introduce yourself before you ask a question, please? Hello. Okay, let me. I, I see some questions here. Trevor, you're on the clock. Okay. Hi. Yeah, I'm Trevor. I'm with the U of A Material Science Department. Um, and I just wanted to know if, within a scientific context, if there is a danger for machine learning algorithms to fall into human biases. So we see this a lot in like a uh, social context, especially with um, facial recognition. Uh, algorithms falling into like gender or race lines. Um, but within a scientific context, I wanted to know if, if you know, there's the, the danger of it looking only for relationships that a human would be interested in. So like, uh, we know that these algorithms can augment human intelligence, but can they also augment human perspective? Thank you. Yeah, that, that is an excellent question. In fact, uh, I, I wanted that some, for somebody to ask it. And thank you, Trevor. So um, yes, the answer is unfortunately yes. Uh, and I would like to, to get to a specific answer to your question by starting with a broader comment. Uh, these type of algorithms that involve machine learning are as good as their education is, their training is, is no different than humans. If you educate well a child and he becomes, uh, let's say, a human uh, resource, an HR representative, and their training on the job is right, they should exhibit minimal biases. If that is not done correctly, then you will end up, as you very well observed in social scientists and in other areas, in law and in, in, in other uh, domains, with biases that will taint the decisions they make. It's the same with machine learning algorithms. If we train them on data sets that only capture some part of the system, they, the, the algorithms will tend to make predictions that are seriously biased by the training data set they have. So in other words, machine learning software needs an education, high quality education, much like humans do. And in the amount of trust we can put in the predictions these codes make would be similar to the trust we put in humans who make decisions in other areas. It can go horribly wrong, but it can also go beautifully right. Thanks, Marius. Uh, anyone else? Nick? Oh, Nick said he's leaving. Okay. Uh, anyone else, uh, folks? Any any other questions? It's a great talk. Uh, I'm sure you have some questions, students. 
Krishna, it's me, Venkat. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, introduce yourself, Venkat. Uh, hello, uh, Marius. It's, my name is Venkat. I met you a long time back, I think, in Chicago. But uh, um, that said, I, I have a question, actually. Statistically, at the atomic scale, we have probabilistic nature, we know. Um, so when you are calculating phase diagrams and when you are showing probabilities for the bulk phases, how do we interpret that pro probability? I mean, what is the, why do we need to have it, have some probabilities for these phases? These are like bulk phases. Right, so um, the reason we need to, 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 to use uncertainty and probabilities uh, in evaluating stability of phases is because there are imperfections in the material that uh, imperfections that are not accounted for in many of the traditional models. Anybody who manufactures, who makes an alloy, for example, will tell you that it depends on the quality, the purity of the, the, the raw materials that you are using. With ceramics, is it worse? It could be the porosity, internal or external. It could be uh, the type of uh, impurities you have. I remember once making a, a certain type of oxide and realizing that the batch of powder that we got from a, a supplier who was different from one delivery, one shipment to the other. But on the phase diagram, we talk about perfect, pristine equilibrium phases. We don't really, at least uh, conventionally, traditionally, we don't want to talk about non-equilibrium or metastable aspects of phases. And that's what I would like to see changed. Okay. To, okay. to, to provide the, the material designer and the technologies with phase diagrams that are more realistic, are closer to the, the real materials. And to do that, we might need to incorporate information about the microstructure, for example, because nobody makes alloys using perfect crystals. Yes, yes, yes. That you, right? So we, we are trying to, to, to make these representations, either visual or non-visual, uh, closer, to bring them closer to the real, to the properties of the real materials that scientists or engineers can encounter in, in their real, in their research, in their studies. Thank you, Marius. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Marius, uh, uh, this is Krishna. I have a question for you, and I may not be able to articulate this very well, but uh, from, I mean, this is related to Venkat's question and your answer, which is the uncertainties that you are providing um, or the error bars you are providing is directly related to the microstructure, the role of defects, which is all captured as a, as a plus or minus or as an error bar, right? Uh, where do you think the field of computational material sciences in terms of really incorporating defects as a, as a predominant uh, you know, surrogate or a marker in, in our models. I mean, lots of times, as, as you rightly pointed out, or Venkat pointed out, we are focusing mostly on bulk pure phases and uh, at what point where we can say that, hey, well, uh, this, the, 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 the change in the whatever in, in the liquidus is due to this kind of a defect or, uh, or in solidus is this, this kind of a defect. Where are we, could we attribute the deviations from uh, pure bulk behavior in terms of which defects are contributing to what and where are we in, in that area? So uh, I, I believe there are uh, several approaches. I will just mention two of them that uh, I think are already ready to be implemented, should there be enough uh, interest and effort. One is defects definitely impact immediately the free energies. Yes. So what we can do is to capture in the free energy various concentrations of defects, and then just calculate diagrams the traditional way uh, with these modified free energies. And yes. we do that sometimes to get uh, uh, metastable phases or to get some uh, non-stoichiometric compounds, you know, oxides, most oxides, cerium oxide and others uh, uh, exhibit non-stoichiometry. Another approach, which I find even more interesting, would be to think of a phase equilibrium in a hyperspace. Yes. That 
as mature con concentration of, of main elements, and then other axes that include defect concentration. It's just that may, we may not be able to visualize those. If it becomes a seven or eight component diagram, we cannot see it. And it's there where it's important to extract an answer that is meaningful, although maybe cannot be represented graphically. Yeah. So, so are there any efforts in MSc where we are using natural language processing to crawl the, all the databases available and, and do much, a much tighter or a much more uh, correlated um, analysis of the error bars? I mean, so um, I'm a physicist and a chemist by training and a computational material scientist by, by profession. I will acknowledge here that chemistry is far more advanced than any other field in using natural language processing to parse okay. journal articles for data. They yeah. can look at hundreds of journal articles and extract enthalpies, their formation and the strengths of the bonds, chemical bonds and all kinds of properties. In material science, we are a bit behind. But okay. It's a goal. I, could, uh, I think there are a couple of questions coming in the chat boxes. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, can you, uh, whoever it is, could you, I, I can't see the chat for some reason. Uh, uh, let me, uh, if, if I can repeat that question. So Shruti Sharma from ASU asks, how do you find, it's an interesting one and I like it. How do you find yourself at the crossroads of such a novel AI study and find time to pursue great <laughs> endeavors like being Walter White boss? Ah, so uh, as, you, <laughs> as you know, um, yeah, so thank you, that, that's an interesting question. It's all about chemistry. Um, you know, Walter, the character in Breaking Bad was a chemistry teacher. Uh, Bogdan, the car wash owner uh, 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 that I played in that series, uh, used lots of chemicals in the process of washing cars. And I have a PhD in chemistry. So although I do not encourage anybody to, to watch Breaking Bad or to learn how to make methamphetamine because uh, the <laughs> process is erroneous, is false on purpose, uh, I would say that uh, it was a, an outstanding experience. And I've learned from that show, from being on set, that uh, it's very important to be disciplined and to, to be focused and, and, and have a tight schedule. That, that was a lesson that I didn't expect to get from a movie crew, how well they were organized, how well they would come together to shoot the scenes. I would say even more disciplined than some of uh, our scientific teams. Uh, so those are creative people who can come together in a very determined, and serious, and well-disciplined way to create something of value. And if you think about scientists and uh, movie makers, create something of value, each of them in their own uh, There's one more question, Marius. Jennifer, do you care? Do you want to ask the question directly? Um, sure, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering if it would ever be an end goal to have the AI um, sort of summarize the results um, and sort of come to its own conclusions and how the learning would differ from that of just be like teaching it to observe and record data. So thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so to have the AI reach their own conclusions, I, I really like that, uh, that element of your question. Is it, is it possible? I don't think it's possible right now. There, there are two efforts that go into uh, towards that. One of them is linking artificial intelligence, especially machine learning, to the fundamental uh, scientific theories. Can we create a software that will examine data and retrieve some of the fundamental laws of nature? There is a, that is a goal. It has not been accomplished yet more or less i'm ready to acknowledge that machine learning is a black box uh, we don't know how to how it works it's a return to empiricism 
to observation, makes extraordinary good predictions, but we don't know how, and it doesn't explain the way it does. Mathematicians, computer scientists, don't fully understand how these algorithms work. And in fact, the second element will be explainability. Can we translate the predictions of a machine learning algorithm to a language that anybody would understand? Still, these two don't get that close to that element of your question that I like very much. Can intelligent software reach their own conclusions? If there is anything that goes closer to that, I would say it's in the reinforcement learning, in the way artificial intelligence software plays games and is able to defeat humans in chess or Go. You may say that after analyzing 10,000 chess games, historical database of chess games, if a software can defeat a human, it means somehow that that software reached some conclusions about how to play chess. But we don't know how it does it. And I did not see any application in science that is as spectacular as intelligent software winning at games. Reinforcement learning is, however, used more and more in science. So it may be that at some point we can have a software that can uh, reach their own conclusion. Just wanted to add that another drawback of artificial intelligence uh, software is that they don't have a sense of humor. Uh, you cannot <laughs> design a software that can create good jokes. They can tell jokes if they find them somewhere, but there have been attempts, and I can share that with you some other time, of creating machine learning algorithms that will uh, produce one-liner line, jokes, and the, the, the attempt ended up miserably. I, I think some of the students had to leave because they had a 12 o'clock class, but uh, so some of them messaged me. Uh, anyone else with, with questions, folks? Uh, this has been a really eye-opening talk and hopefully everyone shares the view, but uh, students who are remaining here, I mean, now is the time. Yeah, go ahead, Wataru. Uh, this is Wataru. I'm a PhD student at U of A. Uh, so the uncertainty that is predicted based on the statistics is based on the data, right? But the data can be different depends on how data was taken, and which includes like the experimental setup or the operators that uh, measure the specific data. So how can we know how reliable the, the uncertainty is under specific experimental setup or the experiment that we are conducted. Okay, good question. And uh, if you send me a message, I will uh, return to you a couple of journal articles that explain the, uh, uh, the methodology behind our approach in detail. But for everybody and summarizing for you, I would say that there are several steps in analyzing the data. One is data curation. So we look at the information we retrieve from databases or journal articles and make sure uh, that error bars are included, or maybe not, that uh, it was, uh, the, the purity of the samples was acceptable. Even that the units are right. We found papers that had the wrong units. Uh, in, <laughs> instead of kilojoules per mole, they had some, some other strange calories. <laughs> so that is the first step. In the second step, the entire body of information is analyzed not only multiple data sets about uh, certain property measurements, but also the uncertainty that comes with each of them. Mm -hmm. So the analysis includes all this information. And then third, there are some hyperparameters that are introduced to determine if the, the estimation of uncertainty that was proposed by the authors of the paper, the original paper, was reasonable. Mm -hmm. And we found that some journal articles say, we have measured the specific heat with plus minus uh, 2%. And the analysis showed that in fact, it was more like plus minus 10%. <laughs> they were overstating certainty. So all these elements are included. And here is the beauty of this. For humans, 
even extraordinarily bright people like my students and the students of Arizona universities will not be able to process this information in a reasonable amount of time. That is why we need to partner with software that can help us, not replace us, but help us do this analysis. Thank you so much. Thanks, Wataru. Anyone else, folks? Uh, I, have a, I have a yeah. question. So, uh, uh, are there any uh, like projects or uh, initiatives at Argonne National Lab to integrate uh, sort of any of these AI uh, techniques, um, and in particularly machine learning, uh, to uh, predict microstructural evolution? I mean, I know that it has been used a lot in the context of machine uh, CalFed approaches. Um, there have been a few articles, including uh, what I've read, uh, but um, is there anything on the level of microstructural evolution yet? Yes, uh, there are several projects, uh, uh, a few of them in, in partnership with Uni Northwestern University and with Carnegie Mellon, looking at uh, uncertainty in uh, microstructure uh, images and also looking at processing microstructure images uh, at a high rate. So if you have 10,000 images and you want to classify them and you want to retrieve automatically which one represents a certain type of structure, again, it will take years for a human to do that. If you, if you get, let's say, 1,000 images per day, you cannot keep up with the rate, with the influx of information. So the, the methodology that's being used relies chiefly on... Uh, uh, computational uh, uh, neural networks is convolutional neural networks is, is image analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and we can discuss about that again. We have some publications uh, uh, about that, how uh, the algorithm is trained using some images of microstructures, including uh, defects and maybe voids. And, and then after training on, let's say, 100 images, it's able to identify features in the test set that are not used for training. So one can create an algorithm that would analyze microstructures and uh, determine their characteristics, much like uh, humans do. But as I said, I'm going back to an answer to a previous question. The quality of such uh, prediction and analysis depends on the training, on the education. If I train that algorithm with a specific type of microstructures and then I apply it to something else, it may not be able to do that well. The training should be comprehensive, should include representative data points, not necessarily how many. Uh, I get often this question, how many data points you need to train an algorithm? It doesn't matter that much. It's how representative the data set is of the physical system. I could have a thousand images that are all about the same type of structure and that would be a poorly way of training the algorithm. Or I could get just 25 that span the entire domain of microstructures and that will be a better uh, training set. Thank you. Any more questions, folks? not i think i have just one final question and this is probably not uh, i mean it's more philosophical how important do you think it is for as as universities where we are training the next generation for us to start incorporating uh, data science machine learning ultimately ai into our syllabus how into our core syllabus i mean do you think we need to be training them on, on assessing data, on assessing the quality of data and analyzing it. I mean, of course, I know the answer kind of, but if you were doing our syllabus, how important on a scale of one to 100, you know, where we are teaching structural properties, physical properties, processing, and you think the fifth column is data? I would say it's extremely important. I would put it in, uh, in the upper, 20%, Okay. Uh, according to your scale. And this is a continuous process. It is never too late to incorporate this in the syllabus. And various universities are, are uh, taking steps at a 
faster or slower speed. Uh, MIT has uh, created a department on AI and a curriculum on AI and invested millions of dollars into that. Now, as with any development in science and in technology, you cannot prepare decades in advance. I did not prepare for this type of work for, this, for enhancing the multi-scale simulations with AI some time ago. So that means I, we all need to continuously learn. And let me show you that I have here on my shelf a book. I don't know if you see this. Yes. <laughs> machine learning and hands-on machine learning with uh, Scikit and uh, TensorFlow and so on. So I'm 59 years old and I'm still learning because I want to keep up with the developments. And your students are lucky to be in an environment where this learning could be structured better than the self-study that I'm doing using that book. So I am very much in favor of incorporating these new elements that, as I said, I believe change the way we do science and engineering. Plus students, in my opinion, are driven nowadays towards learning about AI, various types, computer vision, machine learning, by themselves for applications that may be outside the curriculum. Sure. Good to know. It's good to know how to write a code that recognizes images or does clustering or that, and it's not that hard. Yeah. If, yeah. If, you, if you know Python and you have enthusiasm and dedicate some time, it's not that difficult. No, I agree. And, and I think uh, I'm sure ASU is also doing that. We are seriously incorporating data science, like uh, mod, I mean, not just modeling, not the computational materials part, but the ability to assess your quality of your data that you're producing and, and doing like comparative uh, comparisons with existing data sets that are already available in the literature, how to, um, the curate data and analyze your data and, and but it's a struggle because it's almost like um, you need a, I mean we have the data science institute at the university of arizona and it's a multi-million dollar institute but we are working with them partnering with them but there is the concept of you need domain experts and you need data science experts and and it's kind of always difficult to find an msc person who understands msc who also understands data science uh, Krishna, I would like to add in here uh, just a recent development that we, uh, you know, NSF put out this announcement on AI Institute. Yes. And ASU actually won an AI Institute planning grant. Oh, nice. oh yeah, yes, so great. That's we great. Are in, in sort of this, uh, this transition phase where we are. Yes. We'll probably have a, a great interview. In the yes. So I think uh, the University of Arizona already has the cybers. It's called uh, C Y V E R S E. But I mean, that's besides the point. The, the, the point is exactly like we need these kinds of initiatives to, to push this through. And I think that's where I think people like Marius are going to be very important, not just for the domain per se, but for the next generation of students trying to show them the direction. I'm sure. Marius, sure. thanks a lot. Thank you, Marius. Thank you all. And uh, what can I say? Stay healthy and joyful. Uh, yes. Enjoy <laughs> these turbulent times. Enjoy all Absolutely. the spirits. So, Marius, are you, are you playing soccer, though? Um, not anymore. In Chicago, they think, uh, the local uh, police think soccer is a contact game, and they would yes. let us play, although we told them repeatedly that our, our age is not a contact game anymore, so <laughs> we take contact with the ball at all. But still, they would let. we can play tennis, however. Tennis is accepted. Very That's good. awesome, Marius. We're looking forward to this COVID getting done and you visiting both universities here. Very good. Best wishes to you all, guys. Yeah, thanks, Marius. And, and please pass the good word around about the seminar series. Uh, I think we have seminars all the way till end of spring. I think uh, if you can, if you or any of your colleagues can log in and it's always good to get more eyes on our seminars, for our seminars. Very good. Thanks, Mario. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye. 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 bye all. Bye. Thanks a lot for staying 15 minutes or 25 minutes into the after the talk. Bye, Mario. And bye, bye. And, and let us know once you get the permission. Uh, we'll then yes. upload it. Okay. I, See I you. will send you a message. Bye, bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Ankit.
Bye.